God's mercy, God's peace, your victory are yours through faith in Christ Jesus, amen. Uh, the word of God that we consider again is the, the second lesson for today, um, that section from Hebrews, uh, we'll read and focus really on that first paragraph especially. I am. I can hear it over the, over the top. You probably have to change the battery, Dick, maybe, or something. No, that's okay. The first paragraph. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. A footstool. It's an interesting concept to think about. Um, I don't know what you think of when you hear footstool, uh, but I get the picture of my old recliner uh, that used to fit me, the new one that looks so nice in the living room. You know, ah, it doesn't, it's not the same. Uh, but after, after a day of working and, and uh, sitting in the recliner when you go way back and the footstool kicks up, it's like a deepening of the relaxation. It's, it's like the, the end of the very purpose for which I even rose that day. I can put it to rest and, and be done with it. And I suppose that's an okay thought uh, to, to think of, especially in this section uh, of the letter to the Hebrews uh, that is describing Jesus as a high priest who, who really did what generations of priests could not do after all of the sacrifices day after day continually doing the same ritualistic things that finally in the end because it was so over and over again you realize that they, what they were doing really never paid for any sin and now Jesus the high priest one time offers himself as a sacrifice goes behind the curtain of heaven presents himself to God and sits down at his right hand and he's just waiting for that footstool to be slid out underneath him. The work is done. Still, I think it's always good practice when the scriptures reveal in a word picture way something about our God or his activity for us to dig a little deeper into the scriptures to add a little light on it. This is not the first time that the idea of a footstool came up in this letter. In fact, it was very early on that the writer quotes from a psalm. In chapter 1, he revealed Jesus to be the full radiance of the glory of God, the one who now sits in heaven next to the majesty, as he calls him. And he uses, because these are Old Testament believing Christians that are Hebrews with that background, he uses the Old Testament scriptures uh, to point them to this. And the psalm that is used, Psalm 110, is used to describe this, that he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. One who's familiar with the Old Testament, and in particular the book of Psalms, would recognize this as Psalm 110 and would recognize this as verse 1. It's the lead-in to Psalm 110. It seems that David penned this psalm with maybe his son Solomon in mind, the day when he would be installed as the new king, or maybe even when his real son, the real king, the Messiah, the promised one, would come and he would be installed. 
It's a psalm that goes on to describe that installation and what it is that uh, makes up the footstool uh, of the new king. And uh, it is plainly the enemies of the kingdom. And so that psalm will go on to talk about how God will extend the rule of this king and, and will defeat every nation and every king, crushing them and stacking up dead bodies that will be used as the king's footstool. A footstool of ultimate victory and utter defeat of the king's enemies. We can add a little color to that picture, too, by going back and, and just reliving one story in the Old Testament. In the days of Joshua, maybe the most memorable battle uh, that, that there is in, in Joshua's day against five Ammonite kings, and the Israelites were routing them. The only trouble was they were running out of time, and so God stopped the earth. sun stood still, right, for a day. The five kings had hidden themselves in caves, and it came to Joshua's attention that they had, and they sealed the caves. In essence, they jailed the kings there while they continued to clean up the battle. And when the battle was done, Joshua called his army commanders out, and he had the, the caves unopened. He said, bring those kings to us. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Utter defeat. Ultimate victory. Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, having offered one sacrifice, a sacrifice so perfect, so holy that it makes people perfect and holy all through time. And now he waits. For his enemies to be made his footstool. Ultimate victory for the ultimate king. Utter defeat for his enemy. I guess I'm glad. that I'm with the king, that I'm on his side, that we're in his army, right? Because I don't know how much I'd like to be made a footstool of for one who sits on a throne in heaven and as the scriptures elsewhere say, uses this world as his footstool, I don't think my tiny little neck would take much pressure from the foot of God before it gives way. Thinking forward to that day and whatever that will look like, well, you can imagine who will be there being made footstool. There are certainly the outright, openly hostile enemies of God. There are those who are maybe in ignorance, but that's no excuse before the king, are, are just vile sinners. There's child molesters, there's terrorists, there's serial killers. There's tyrants, there's thieves, robbers, there's no end to those who ultimately, no matter how hostile they are to the king, will have their necks under his foot. 
I guess we ought to be thankful that we're on the right side. But I ask, what makes you on the right side? Have you been so on his side that while you've spent your time here in this world, you've dedicated yourself so wholly to him that, that the material and the worldly concerns haven't over-occupied you? Has your trust and your confidence in, in the creator and, and the ruler of this world been, been so perfect and so complete that you've not worried about foolish things? Have you been, while he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, while you're waiting for that day, have you been so on his side that, that you've been so engrossed with the way that he rules in your life, which is through his word? Have you been so engrossed in that that you've proven yourself to be on his side? Have you been so bold as a soldier in his army in your conviction and your confession of the gospel of grace to this world in the face of hostilities that no one, not even God, can see that finally in your heart really you're a traitor to the cause? We ought to be there. No matter who we are, no matter what we think of ourselves and our delusions, we're footstool material. But for the sacrifice of the king. Our victory is only because it's the priest whose foot comes down on the necks of not so much his enemies, but ours. He's the one who's overcome sin and death and Satan and hell and our own flesh. His victory is our victory over every enemy we've ever faced, including the one that looks back in the mirror at us. The only question that remains while we wait is how do we serve him? How do we respond to his love, to his sacrifice, to his work, to his war, to his win for us? What's awesome about the way that this letter is put together is you don't have to ponder these things in a vacuum. The writer actually goes on, and I want to share with you the next paragraph after this section. It starts with, what is a giant word, therefore. Because of all that we know that Christ has done for us as our king, as our priest, as the ultimate victor, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of our faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience 
and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage each other. And all the more, as you see the day approaching. We know who the victor is. We know how the victory's been won. We know how the one once dead is now alive forever and ever. Our response is to grow in that. To know that more every day. To gather together regularly, routinely digesting this wonderful news, growing in our understanding of it, encouraging each other and spurring each other on to do this more and more so that the love that the King has shown to us and to this world is reflected in us. You know what? then we'll even look like we're on his side. Because he'll make us to look just that way. May the glorious victory that our Lord Jesus has won for us inspire our hope, fill our minds and our hearts, and give glory to the one who has won. Amen.